Well, hey, good morning, Peace Church. It's good to see all of you. Uh, just take a look around because we know all the real Christians come to church on Labor Day weekend here in West Michigan. So go ahead and see, see who it is we're working with. And uh, um, now if we can all go before the Lord and repent for uh, putting our faith in our good works in church attendance. Um, I'm just, just kidding. But uh, for real, thank you guys for coming. Thanks, Pastor John. Appreciate it. Um, thank you guys for coming to week two of our practice soft launch um, service. We're figuring a lot of stuff out, and we are really excited for what the Lord's going to do in and through this church, which we all know is us, right? The church is not a building, but it's a people that gather. And so we're excited to see what the Lord does. And this morning, we are still in our Honest to Goodness series, looking at the Psalms. And we're going to look at a Psalm written by the name of a man named Ethan. We're not exactly sure who Ethan is, but it's Psalm 89. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 89. We're going to be camped out there um, this morning. But before we dive into the psalm, I just want to ask you if you've ever experienced something um, or you've ever had an experience that didn't meet your expectations. Maybe you expected one thing, you got another. I know for a fact my wife has one experience being married to me that did not meet her expectations, that's for sure. But I, I wonder if you guys know what happened on this date in history, September 1st, 2007. Any fellows know what happened on September 1st, 2007? You guys remember this game, Michigan versus Appalachian State? It was the beginning of the end for a while for Michigan football. Or what about uh, this date? Who remembers what this was? No. <laughs> he just recreated it. Right, uh, the, the blocked punt, six seconds left, little brother blocks the punt, returns it for a touchdown, and we lose. And I said little brother because I know Jason's not here. He would, he would beat me up afterwards if, if I said that. But um, yeah, block the punt, return it for the game-winning touchdown, expectation, reality. And so this morning, I know for a fact that all of us have, ex have experienced times in our lives where the reality of what we're experiencing or walking in does not line up with what we read about in God's promises to his people in the scriptures. In Psalm 89, we, as we look at Ethan writing Psalm 89, he's pouring out his heart because it's what he's experiencing in um, his day and time it does not match what God said he would do, and we'll take a look at that. But Psalm 89, as I said, was written by a man named Ethan, and we're not exactly sure who Ethan was. Some believe Ethan to be the Ethan mentioned in 1 Kings 4, verse 31, where when we're talking about Solomon, and Solomon was the, the wisest man to ever live, and the person that they use as the, metri the metric or the measuring stick to wisdom was a man named Ethan. And so in the scripture, it's saying Solomon's wisdom surpassed that even of Ethan's. And so some people believe that this is the Ethan that is responsible for these Psalms, but um, we're not exactly sure, nor do we know the exact context that the Psalm was written in. We don't know what's happening in the life of Israel, the people of God, it, exactly. There's some good guesses that we can make, um, but ultimately, for our purposes, we don't need to know exactly the context because we all understand what it means when God says one thing and we feel like we're experiencing another. And so if you will, go ahead and uh, open up to Psalm 89, and we're going to read the first four verses, and then we're going to skip down to verse 38, and we'll read through verse so verse 1 starts out, I will sing of the steadfast love of God of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. 
You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Now skip down to verse 38 and we'll pick it up there. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword. And you have, made, you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth, and you have covered him with shame. Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing full well what it means when our reality doesn't match our expectation. Lord, we understand the words of Ethan when he, he cries out and he says, we'll sing of the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord, and yet makes these accusations of what he's seeing in his life. And so, Lord, I pray that as we dive into this space, the gap in between expectation and reality, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be present, that your spirit would minister to each person here in the exact way that they need to be ministered to, that you would give me the words to speak to their hearts, and, Lord, that it would be to your glory and honor that all of this would be had and done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So that brings us to our main point for this morning. Thank you. Our main point is an honest to goodness faith can be honest with God because of his or her trust in him. An honest to goodness faith can be honest with God because of his or her trust in him. And it says in here, or I have in here, Okay. Our ability to be honest is built upon God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And we'll look at verses 1 and 2 for that. And then our ability to be honest is built upon God's covenant promises. And we'll look at verses 3 and 4 for that. And then Ethan shows us that we can be honest when God prom- with, we can be honest when God's promises to us don't line up with our reality. Now we'll look at 35 through, uh, 38 through 45 for that. But point one, let's dive in here. An honest to goodness faith can be honest with God because of his or her trust in him. And our ability to be honest is built upon God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Ethan writes forever and to all generations. Why? Because God and Ethan have an eternal mindset. God's steadfast love and faithfulness is eternal. He is not concerned with the immediate. And this is hard for us to comprehend because we only know that which has a beginning and an end. But God himself, his very essence, is eternal. God simply is. He is. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, our reality now becomes one where we experience, sing about, and proclaim the steadfast love and faithfulness of God, not only to our generation and our children's generation, but to all generations. I know there has been times, and maybe you've needed to be reminded But there have been times in your life, without a shadow of a doubt, that you have experienced the love and faithfulness of God. That you have experienced the love and faithfulness of God. So you know that God is good. You know that God is faithfulness, or is faithful. 
You've experienced it. It's not something you've read about and only know in theory, but you yourself, as you sit here today, you have personally experienced God's goodness. And if you've experienced God's goodness once, we know without a shadow of a doubt that God is good forever. And so throughout our lives and throughout our history. So you know that he is good. You know that he is faithful. You know you've experienced it once, and you know that to be his character. But still, we get caught up in the immediate. We get caught up in our own kingdom rather than God's kingdom. And when we're caught up in our own kingdom, it makes it difficult to see what God is up to in his kingdom. So when we don't have an eternal perspective, where we often miss the eternal significance of actions or events that don't make sense in our immediate mindsets or our immediate time frames. And all too often, when we, don't have it, when we don't have an eternal mindset, when we're not looking at his kingdom, we take our eyes and we place them on ourselves. And we look at the actions of God and we look at the things that he's doing through how it affects me, not how it affects his people as a whole all throughout history. So we have got to get our eyes off of ourselves and get them up. Get them on God. Another idea here is that God's steadfast love and faithfulness will at times overpower your individual personal desires or your individual personal will. We don't like that. In short, God is in control. And so can I just confess something to you here? I am a recovering control freak. Is this a safe place? Can we, can we turn this into a meeting? Hi, my name is Aaron. <laughs> Hi. And I am a recovering control freak. See, and I know that to be the case. And my control oftentimes bumps up against God's control. And when my control and God's control bumps up against each other, who wins? God. God wins. See, all of creation proceeds from and belongs to God, myself included. That's all of creation throughout all of history from the time God said, let there be light, to the time Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, up until the time we hear the trumpets at Jesus' second coming, he is and always will be sovereignly in control of his creation. Which means he gets to decide what happens with and to his creation. He gets to tell us how to act. He gets to tell us how to behave. He gets to tell us what to do. He gets to tell us the attitudes that we should have. And if I know anything from uh, being the dad to a 13-year-old girl, is that attitude issue is a big one, right? My daughter does not like me correcting her attitude. And to be fair, that's probably the most difficult aspect I have when God comes down to correct my attitude. All of a sudden, I turn into a 13-year-old girl <laughs> responding to God. Think you can tell me what to do? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can. See, now, I know we didn't read them, but when we look at verse, uh, verses 5, 9, 11, God's control is all throughout this psalm. So verse 5, he talks about how the heavens are under God's control. Verse 9, he talks about how he rules over the seas. Verse 11 says, the heavens are yours, the earth is yours, the world and all that is in it is yours. See, God's steadfast love and faithfulness showcases that God is in control and focused on eternity. And Ethan understood, 
that he could be honest with God with his experience because of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Point number two. Our ability to be honest is built upon God's covenant promises. God's covenant promises. First, let's start by defining what exactly covenant means. And so covenant is an agreement or a contract between God and man. It presupposes two or more parties that come together to make a contract, agreeing on uh, promises, stipulations, privileges, responsibilities. You may have heard of Christians being referred to as God's covenant people. Well, and that's because we are, in fact, in covenant with God, and we are God's chosen people. We are those that God made a covenant with. And so there's, there's two major covenants. There's lots of covenants throughout the scriptures, but there's two major ones, and you may know them best as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Covenant is sometimes translated as, as testament. And so our Bible is divided between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so the Old Covenant is the covenant that God made with Abram, right? The New Covenant is the, the covenant that, that Christ came and died on the cross, and so now we place our faith in him, and it's through faith that we are now forgiven, and so that's the New Covenant. And so we are a covenant people. And so what Ethan is talking about here. Is, and we'll talk a little bit more about covenants in a few minutes, but for our purposes here, what we need to see and what Ethan is talking about is that God made a covenant with David. So first, the Lord simply shows up and chooses David, just chooses him. Not because there's anything special about David. David was a shepherd at this time. And there were probably hundreds or thousands of young men who were shepherds, who lived and died and went throughout their lives. And yet, he looked at David and he chose David. And so in 1 Samuel 16, God instructs uh, Samuel, who Samuel was the prophet, prophet in the Old Testament, he, he instructs Samuel to go and anoint David as the coming king. And so verse 7 says this about David. Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. So what happened is Saul, or, um, Samuel comes and David's dad is like, okay, so one of my kids, one of my kids is going to be anointed king. I know which one. I know it's the oldest. He's the tallest. He's the most manly. He's the most rugged. Like this dude just looks like a king. And so David's dad goes and gets um, the oldest brother and he comes for, and then Samuel looks and says, nope. And this is what he says. He says, don't do not look at his appearance, not his height or his stature, because I have rejected him. That's David's brother. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. See, from this line, the line of David, a king is going to rule forever. That's the covenant promise that God made to David that Ethan is referring to in verses uh, 3 and 4. So we see this covenant that the Lord made with David in 2 Samuel 7. So this is where the Lord promises to make one family from the line of David, David as the representative of his people. Um, verses 8 through 17 in 2 Samuel uh, 7 are des described, or describe this covenant that God is making. And so this is where David expresses his desire to build a house for the Lord, but then the Lord comes and says, oh, no, 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 no. So again, we see even in David, he has his own wants, his own desires, his own will, and then the Lord comes in and says, actually, no, I have something better. I have something grander. And this is what, this is what he says in uh, 2 Samuel I was already there. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. He says, The Lord does not approve and inst instead states his own initiative that he will establish David's house eternally, promising him an eternal throne. 2 Samuel 7, 16 here. It says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established 
forever. So Ethan trusts in God's steadfast love and faithfulness and his, go- his covenant promises. So Ethan is fully trusting God here. And Ethan is saying, like, it's because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness and your, the fact that you're true to your covenant promises that this is where Ethan's tone shifts in verse 37. Or verse 38. It says, But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed, that being David. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. So again, we see Ethan. He's saying, I trust in your love. I trust in your faithfulness. I trust in your promises. That's why this doesn't make sense. If Ethan didn't trust in God's goodness and his steadfast love and his faithfulness and his covenant promises, now all of a sudden Ethan doesn't have to bring that back up to God saying, why is this happening? But he's saying you have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth, and you have covered him with shame. You have covered him with shame. See, we cannot forget God's love and faithfulness in difficult times, even when we're struggling to see them. I said earlier, we don't know the exact context that this psalm was written in, so we don't know what he's referring to exactly as David's enemies are surrounding him and his walls are breached, and so we don't know exactly what's, what's happening. But I do know that when it feels like our lives are falling apart and it feels like our walls are being breached, when it feels like God's good promises that he's spoken over our lives aren't being fulfilled, we have a model from Ethan of what it means to truly lament, to truly bring that back up to God. See, if we don't actually believe God will do what he says he will do, there's no reason for us to lament. We only lament because we trust in God's steadfast love and faithfulness and the fact that he keeps his promises. We look too, and we didn't cover these, but uh, if you go back and read the psalm in its entirety, We look, verses 30 through 34. So there's a a grouping of if statements. So the psalm says, If his children forsake my law, if they violate my statutes and command, then I will punish their transgressions. But I will not remove my steadfast love. I will not violate my covenant. See, Ethan can't see in the immediate what God is doing. And that's why he responded in verse, um, verse 46 where he says, How long, O Lord? How long? See, Ethan is not doubting God's promises here. Ethan's honesty, his lament before the Lord, is built upon God's faithfulness. It's a lament that trusts his covenant promises. Ethan knows God makes good on those promises, and that's the whole reason for his lament. And Ethan models for us a faith that does not waver amid gut-wrenching circumstances that appear to be the opposite of what the Lord said he would do. His faith in God does not negate how how difficult the situation is, but his faith in God, even in these hard times, is what gives him hope. 
is what gives him hope. And you know this feeling. Problems come up in your lives. Another thing goes wrong. All the positive progress you seem to have been making vanishes in an instant. And we wonder, Lord, are you there? Lord, do you want me to actually experience life? Are you going to help me? Are you going to come alongside me? Do you care about my pain? Do you care about my hurt? Or maybe we ask some things like, are you going to reveal yourself to my daughter? Are you going to reveal yourself to my son, to our loved one who is far from you? I think we all know the pain that Ethan is describing in this psalm. But then Ethan asks an important question. And we'll look at verses 46 through 48 and we'll close with this idea. So he talks about how great God is, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, how he keeps his covenant promises, but then things are not going as they should go, Lord, based upon what it is you said. And he says this, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity have you created all the children of man? What man, verse 48, what man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? See, we know how this story ends. And Ethan was right in trusting God's steadfast love and faithfulness, trusting in God's covenant promises, because... What Ethan couldn't see in the immediate that God was doing over eternity was reconciling all people to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And through the bloodline of David, Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life here on earth, and he went to the cross for your sins, for my sins. And on the cross, when he said, it is finished, he meant it. And so not only are our sins forgiven as he paid for them on the cross, but we actually in return receive his righteous life. The blessings in full that are ascribed to him, we now receive as a result of what God was doing. So Ethan's looking at this, and he doesn't see the big picture the way we do because we have the Old and the New Testaments. And so we get to look at this and say, yes, Ethan, yes. God's steadfast love and faithfulness, and he keeps his covenant promises. And so as Ethan models for us a faith that does not waver amid gut-wrenching circumstances that appear to be in the opposite of what the Lord said he would do, we, through Jesus Christ, can trust God's steadfast love and faithfulness that he's going to keep his covenant promises. And like Ethan, our faith does not waver Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. Father, like Ethan, we struggle. We struggle with seeing what it is that you're up to. We struggle with seeing how all the pieces are going to connect. We struggle with seeing how your covenant promises are going to be fulfilled. But Lord, we trust that they will. Give us the kind of faith we need to trust you in the midst of difficult circumstances. Lord, I pray that you give us the ability to voice our concerns, to voice when things don't make sense, Lord, to voice the fact that our reality is not matching up with our pro- the promises that you have gave us. And so, Lord, it's because we believe in your steadfast love and faithfulness and in your covenant promises that we can lament biblically to you. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that we, unlike Ethan, know how the story ends, that you defeat death on the cross through your son, Jesus Christ. 
And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.